Hey everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show here and welcome to episode 15 of Forensics Talks. Before we get started today, just a few things to uh, announce here. Uh, one is that I am going to be running a um, bullet impact research study that I'm call making a call out for some participants. I've already announced this online and such, but if you have an opportunity to help out, uh, if you go over to my website on the research page, or uh, actually you'll see a little uh, path there, or a little link, and it's called the Bullet Impact Study. If you get an opportunity uh, to help out, it takes about an hour. Uh, there's a If you sign up, there's like an email that comes to you. There's a tutorial video and everything else. So I explain everything there. So if you have an opportunity, uh, that'd be fantastic. Um, the second thing is that uh, the Association of Crime Scene Reconstruction just announced that uh, they're going to be having a conference on March 2nd to 4th, 2021. And I believe it's going to be a combination of virtual and live. So um, they have a call out for presenters at the moment. So you can always go to the ACER website, just uh, acsr.org. If you head over to their conference page, there's uh, some links. You can also find the links online as well. And of course, uh, the other one is the IABPA. I would be remiss if I don't put this one up there because our guest today is the president of the IABPA. So I think we got to give them a little bit of a plug. It's just less than a month now. And uh, the IABPA had their conference online. It was uh, like four days of uh, a whole bunch of uh, really excellent presentations and in all different regions. So uh, if you are interested in bloodstain pattern analysis, uh, head over there and have a look. All right, so uh, today my guest is Celestina Rossi. Uh, she is a senior crime scene investigator with the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office uh, in Conroe, Texas. Uh, she has a master peace officer's license with 21 years of law enforcement, and she uh, promoted or was promoted to the crime laboratory in 2002. She's been qualified as an expert in latent print examination, uh, bloodstain pattern analysis, which is the topic for today, crime scene reconstruction, and shooting incident reconstruction. Uh, Chelly's an adju adjunct instructor for the Texas Forensic Science Academy at the Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service, and she teaches multiple courses there, including uh, forensic technician, bloodstain pattern analysis, and processing evidence of violent crimes. Um, she's also the secretary of the Texas Division of the IAI, where she served since 2006. Um, she is the past president of the Association of Crime Scene Reconstruction, and she's currently the president of the IABPA. And there's a lot more that I can say about her. So let me just bring her in here. Chelly, hello. Thank you very much for being here today. Hello, Eugene. Thank you for having me. All right. So there's been a lot going on in the blessing community um, recently, at least for me anyway, like the 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 conference a while back, uh, two weeks ago, I did a, uh, a talk with David Cam talking about bloodstain pattern analysis. Um, Yesterday, just yesterday, I did a, a presentation. Uh, Pharaoh is having, or they just finished their virtual conference. It was a 24 hour conference. And I did a presentation on 3D technologies for bloodstain pattern analysis. So it seems like there's just a lot going on. So I think it's fitting that we talk to you to kind of close uh, the the uh, the year out here. So I didn't say it at the beginning, but um, this is the last, this is gonna be the last one for 2020 before I start up again. I need a break. I need this, I got work to do. <laughs> so, but, um, well, I want to talk to you um, about your entry into law enforcement and um, when you first, I, I'm not sure what you were doing before this career, but how did you, how did you step in or what was it that got you in there? Wow. So that's a, oh, we're just going to come off with that kind of a question. So um, I graduated from, I graduated from college in two, in 1995, I'm um, in Wyoming and um, was going to just come to Texas for the summer. And once I got here, I was like, well, I need a job and was kind of having struggles finding, you know, it, I was up in East Texas. And so there wasn't a lot of opportunities in what I thought I wanted to do, which was originally some kind of hospital administration type type career. Um, ultimately I ended up getting a job as a dispatcher for the Trinity police department. And so it's a really small town. My mother thought I was crazy. She threatened to come back to Texas and get me because she's like, I don't know what's happened. You, you just need to come back to Wyoming. I'm like, no, 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 it'll be fine. I, like, I'll figure this out. So I went from Trinity PD uh, to the county sheriff's office. And from there, 
um, I was, it was recommended that I consider moving the 60 miles from Trinity County down here to Montgomery County. Uh, Montgomery County has, um, you know, about a half million people in, in the county, all of which, pretty much all of which is policed by the sheriff's office. So most of it is unincorporated. The city of Conroe has about um, 150,000 people, but for the most part, all of the, the people live in an unincorporated area, therefore being policed by the county sheriff. And so I thought, you know, in, in my really young 20s that, that that sounded exciting. And and so I came to Montgomery County in 1997. And shortly after that, I was convinced by our sheriff at the time, Guy Williams, that I should consider going to the police academy. And so if you've never really been to Wyoming, there's not a lot of people there. There's the you know, still to this day, there's less than a half million people um, in the state of Wyoming and and not a lot of female cops. Um, I think I saw one my entire life living there. So um, that was a really big stretch for me to consider, you know, first moving to Texas. Now I'm considering going to the police academy. But again, I'm young and I'm like, you know what, I, I can absolutely do this. So um, I did. I went to the police academy. I worked in our county jail for about nine months is all um, before I transferred to patrol. And I loved patrol. I love being a patrol officer. Um, we work um, single man units here. And so I worked the evening shift um, in our South, which um, South Montgomery County, which borders Harris County, which is Houston. And it was, it was great. Um, and then in, 2002, I got a phone call from the lieutenant over the crime lab, Peggy Frankhauser, and she said that I had been recommended by some of my peers to take an open position here in the crime lab. And, you know, back then in 2002, really no one knew what CSI was. You know, there wasn't the hype. There wasn't the TV shows. People weren't talking about it. Um, but CSI has been around forever, right? Um, but it just really wasn't in the mainstream, like, like what we know of it today. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I thought, well, if I don't take this position, it's never going to come around again. So I thought, sure, I, you know, I, that's not what I really thought that my career was going to look like, but I thought I would give it the chance. And man, ever since then, um, it has been, it has been a blink of an eye. It has yeah. gone by so fast. So, um, I mean, you had a number of things on your CV, like latent prints. I mean, you're doing multiple things, like most CSIs or like they have to be jacks of all trade, right? They need to know a lot of different things, but many of them specialized in one or two particular areas. And, you know, you are, I call you the queen bee of BPA because, you know, you're very passionate about it. So when did you first uh, get introduced to BPA and when like training wise and, and when did you first become certified? So I... I, as with any um, new crime scene investigator, we start looking for any formalized training. So a 40 hour class, you know, a 40 hour forensic type course that's being taught. Um, that could include, like you mentioned, latent prints. So that's a 40 hour basic latent print identification class where you're just learning how to look at an inked print versus you know, like a par part of an inked print to a rolled fingerprint, um, you know, and so there's photography classes, there are processing classes, and some of those classes that come up are bloodstain classes. So in January, it was either January or February of 2003 was the first like 40 hour basic introductory bloodstain class, and it was in Austin. And so um, I was told by my lieutenant that, hey, I needed to make arrangements to go to this class. And once I went there, I was like, wow, this is fascinating. Like this is this, you know, from what you think you know about how blood behaves once it leaves the human body. It was just so, so amazing to me, just the the aspect of it. And so once I took the first class, I was like, OK, when can I go to the second class? And I think that next class was just a couple months later, like in April. And then I was, I remember being in that class and knowing like, I'm, I, I'm not smart enough to do this. I, I can't do this. I, I, you know, I, I, this is challenging. It's hard. I, you know, I, I, it's complex. I don't, you know, I haven't learned enough to be here. And so 
honest story. I was sitting in my car at 9 a.m. on Wednesday morning while class is going on. We had taken a break and I had gone out to the car and I was going to come home because I really felt like I wasn't smart enough to be in that class. And so I called back home and talked to some of my colleagues and they're like, do not, do not leave the class <laughs> back in there. And I'm like, I can't. This is this. I, I don't know what I'm doing. This is hard. And they're like, OK, well, it's Wednesday and you have till Friday. And so if on Friday you're still feeling the same way, then then we're going to reevaluate. And so I, you know, pretty much, you know, the proverbial talked me off the ledge. And so with, you know, big red eyes and and because I've been crying and I, I'm a softy. Anyone that knows me knows I am pretty tender hearted, even after, you know, 25 years in in law enforcement. I am pretty I'm pretty tender hearted. But that day I was like, you know, that just the stress of the class and the the technical aspect of it. I was like, I like obviously everyone else in that class is way smarter than I am. So I went back in tail tucked and, you know, it, it seemed like then after, you know, like a couple more hours, things really kind of started coming together for me. Mm -hmm. And then it was that that kind of really just kind of catapulted me into, OK, I recognized that this is really hard and I recognize that that um, this was going to be a challenge. And so, you know, I've had a lot of challenges in my life and I've never backed down from any of them. And so I thought, OK, here we go. This is something that's that's got my number and it will not beat me. And so I have spent from early 2003 until every day, you know, that I it continues to try to challenge me and I continue to try to learn as much as I can about it. Mm -hmm. That's great. And um, uh, so how long, about how many years or how much time did it take before you would say from when you began your journey with bloodstain pattern analysis until you, let's say you were walking on your own, you were testifying um, and, and sort of you felt like, okay, um, this is it now. Now I'm good to go. Wow. So even that, you know, I, I really felt like, and I, I often, when I talk to students and, and, you know, college kids, you know, and or even new CSIs. And I, I tell them, I said, you know, like I, man, for the first two and a half, three years, every day, it seems like kind of looking back, I'm, I'm thinking I'm not smart enough to be here. Like there is like you make, you know, I mean, there's so many things that you have to know about, right? Like you had mentioned in the beginning, you know, this jack of all trades. Well, it's not really a jack of all trades per se, but you know, when you're going out on a scene and you're tasked with collecting all, you know, potential forensic evidence that could prove or refute, you know, a, a suspect or suspects, you have to know about those disciplines. So you have to know about latent prints and you have to know about hairs and fibers and you have to know about shoe marks and tire tread and, you know, guns. You have to know everything about guns, like mm -hmm. guns, pistols, rifles, you know, you have to know how to make those guns safe. You have to know, you know, how, how do they, how do they function? And, um, you know, I mean, there's just so many aspects of, of forensics that you have to at least know something about, or else you're really, you know, you're a detriment out there at that scene. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it is just, um, a lot to have to, wrap your head around. And so when it comes to blood stain pattern analysis, I, man, I studied and I studied and I went to courses and I had the opportunity to go out of state and take other classes, um, blood stain classes. I, I had been to, you know, at that point to Iowa and for several courses. And it wasn't until um, 2007 um, that I had my opportunity to finally sit in a courtroom and testify about um, a case that I had worked mm -hmm. uh, in 2000, Christmas of 2005. And even sitting on the stand, I was, I mean, it, it was, I mean, that, that I will remember that for the rest of my life. Yeah. You know, you said something where you said, you know, BPA is hard and that, that, uh, that, that struck me with a couple of things. And one was just yesterday, I had, I had a slide that said BPA is hard <laughs> and exactly. And that came from, I don't know if you remember, I don't remember the gentleman's name, but in at the IABPA conference in Chicago in, well, the year before la this last year, 
um, there was somebody who came up, they drove up and they gave a presentation. And one of the things that they said to the group was, you know, DNA and, and latent prints or whatever are sort of, uh, are sort of ahead. And those are, those are areas where, for example, you make a match or you don't, it's kind of like in between. And there are complex scenarios that you get in those, but he said, BPA is hard where, where it's one of those areas it's being criticized or it's under a lot of scrutiny and everything else. But BPA, if you think about getting to a crime scene and looking at a, a number of patterns, which could be very complex overlapping, it's not clear cut. Like you can't just say, well, you know, I know exactly what happened now. No, it doesn't work that way. And so um, where do you think we are? Um, you know, if you, if you look at BPA on, on the grand scale of things, um, you know, how much more advancement, how much more development do you think BPA has to go before it's considered maybe by most as, you know, a more robust discipline? Man, that's a, that's an, a, mil a million dollar question. Um, you know, I really think that our, the thing that is kind of the anchor that is dragging us down is kind of like what we just saw with your interview with David Cam, right? is that we have blips in time, not, you know, David, I'm sorry if you're watching this. I was, I do not consider your case a blip in time. Meaning though, that like we have seen David Cam, Joe Bryan, Julie Ray, Brad Jennings, right? Where their cases are, have an aspect of bloodstain pattern analysis that turns out to be like, horribly wrong. And, um, and so those are the, the snips of time where, man, it's like an anchor on bloodstain where, you know, it hits the media, it hits the, it, you know, it hits the mainstream. And that really just highlights like where the, the judicial system is failing. Um, when it comes to the people that they allow to sit in the bench and give expert witness test or expert testimony. Um, and so when you look at bloodstain as a forensic science, I think it's sound, right? It's, it is hard. It is complex, but it's, it's based in science. And so I think on that aspect, it's good. Now, are there advancements? Are we making leaps and bounds with the research that's coming out and the research that's being done and, and kind of some innovative ideas and, and we're getting more precise, you know, analysis and results. Sure. But when it comes to, to following a methodology and, and, you know, everyone using a, a, an approved methodology, I think we're that, that is sound. The problem is the anchor that drags us down is when we start recognizing that, there are people testifying against, you know, defendants that probably have no business testifying. Yeah, it seems like there's uh, it's it's important to um, train the new bloodstain pattern pattern analyst on the limitations of what they can and can't say. And I know, like you know, these courtroom style questions are sometimes like, okay, can I say this or can I not say this? Is it scientifically valid? And sometimes it's hard because you may feel like you know, I. I, I think this is what happened, but maybe I can't prove it. Or maybe, you know, um, maybe it doesn't have a good scientific background or whatever, even though there may be some good reason for it. But well, uh, also, not to interrupt Eugene, mm -hmm. but also the problem is, is that sometimes your agency sends you to a class. So you come from an agency and, you know, if, if your viewers are from a law enforcement agency, they understand this. If they're not from a law enforcement agency, they probably don't. But you know, training monies are super valuable. So, you know, you come to an agency and then, you know, it's like, okay, you can go to one, one training this year. And so you've got all of these people, but then you only get to go to one class. And so, you know, you've got people that are managing monies and you've got people that are man managing training money. And so they're like, okay, well, it, see if you can find a class that only costs this much. And so you look through everyone that's advertising training and it's like, okay, well, I found this class and it's, you know, at this place and it's only this many dollars. And it's like, okay, great, go. Okay, well, if you're from an agency that doesn't have a, a history of, of, you know, 
like someone that is part of these associations that support, you know, training and education. I mean, you just, you read the, the, the training, you know, the training course and you're like, Oh, this sounds fantastic. And you go. And then when you get back to your agency, your administration thinks, well, we sent you to training now go do the work. And so you go and you do. And if you don't have somebody that is making you sign a contract that says, Hey, FYI, this is an introductory course. And after you take it, you're not qualified to do bloodstain pattern analysis. You're not qualified to give anyone an opinion about what you think. This is just a familiarization course so that you know the terminology, you know how, you know, different bloodstain patterns are made, but that does not qualify you to start giving expert testimony. And so often is what I hear and what we're seeing with these cases is that people are given opinions that either had one class, they maybe, you know, took a class and the person teaching the class wasn't qualified to instruct, you know, the person teaching isn't even part of any of the forensic, the, the recognized forensic organizations, but yet your administration expects, hey, we just spent this much money on you go do that job. Yeah. That's a good and, point. and so they're, you know, they're obeying their administration and they're going out there and doing it. And then the district attorney's office, right. They get a CV. They're like, Oh, here, I had this class. And so here's my report. And this is what I did at the scene. And so the district attorney's office is like, well, you know more than I do and you know more than these 12 jurors. So therefore by, by statute, you're an expert and they proffer you as an expert. And now you're testifying and, you know, with the defendant's life in your hands, like, mm -hmm. you know, what we have seen time and time again. It's interesting. So and, and some of that, um, I'd, I'd like to actually talk about the the Texas uh, Forensic Science Commission, because I think a lot of these issues have come up in, in those discussions that you've been having and you've been directly involved in all of that. Can you give us a brief um, background on the, the commission and um, sort of maybe a little bit about how you got involved and some of the things that have come out of a lot of these meetings. So yeah, so the Texas Forensic Science Commission was established by legislature, by the Texas state legislature in 2005. And it was originally designed to look at the state laboratories, um, the different forensic services being provided by the state lab. Um, in 2013, Senate Bill 1238 um, enabled the Forensic Science Commission to kind of expand their, their um, scope, um, which expanded it to allow them to investigate um, agencies that were not accredited. So before, from 2005 to 2013, they just looked at like, a, they looked at accredited laboratories. And so as part of accreditation with um, you know, uh, non-disclosures and, and um, self-reporting, they handled all of that in, until 2013 when that scope expanded. And it allowed them to look at even non-accredited agencies um, that were doing forensic science, you know, like they were, that were doing forensics. So, you know, local police departments, local sheriff's offices, um, private laboratories that, that may be doing some, some, aspect of forensics and even private consultants that were doing, um, had forensic services. And so, um, it gave them kind of that opportunity up, up to autopsies. They were not, you know, they, they, they don't look into, to, um, autopsies because that's usually done by a medical doctor, or I think it's always done by a medical doctor. And so the commission is responsible for establishing procedures, policies, and practices to improve the quality of forensic science in Texas. And, and so that's, um, you know, that, that's where they, you know, they're housed in Austin. And so it was an avenue for um, not only agencies to report any kind of, of non-disclosures or, or self-reporting, but it was also a way that attorneys and defendants and coworkers could um, file a complaint to the commission on whatever they felt like they needed the commission to look at. And the commission would then, then investigate that complaint. 
Okay. And um, when did they start really looking seriously at BPA and looking at the requirements of BPA? So where I first became aware of there being kind of a, a problem per se with bloodstain pattern analysis in the state of Texas uh, was at the end of 2017. I was um, an expert witness for the Dallas County District Attorney's Office um, to testify in a homicide case that they were working. And I was told by the prosecutor up there that there was um, their appellate division at the Dallas County DA's office had been in talks with the Texas Forensic Science Commission. And there was going to be a meeting um, in November, at the beginning of November, to decide where, what the status of bloodstain pattern analysis was in Texas. And I was like, okay, this is the first I've heard of anything like that. Um, and so their meetings are live streamed. And um, so I looked up online, I pulled their, their agenda. And so I tuned in along with my sergeant, and my lieutenant, because I'm like, hey, this is supposedly there's this big meeting that's going to happen with the commission and they're going to decide what, how bloodstain is going to be in Texas. And so I sat there and listened to it, um, you know, kind of without, you know, without an avenue to ask a question, um, interject. And I was terrified because I felt like the, some of the people that were providing, um, what they knew about bloodstain in Texas, um, wasn't what, what my opinion was. And so I know a couple of the folks that sit on, sit on the commission just by um, doing presentations at universities. Um, and so I contacted one of them and I, I asked if I could please have them call me back. I really wanted to speak to Lynn Garcia, who is lead counsel for the commission and just maybe give her some different insight on what they were talking about. And she called me back and it was fantastic. We had a really nice chat. Um, and then they decided that they were going to in panel um, lots of experts from around the country, and, as well as myself, um, Christine Ramirez, who uh, works for the Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service. And so they assembled a meeting. I believe that was in December. And we all went to Austin. Um, it was divided up into 15 minute blocks on um, different topics that they had and different questions that they wanted answered. And then in January, they, or I think that the, actually they impaneled, we impaneled in January um, and it was an all day event. And then by f the beginning of February, they made a decision that if you were going to do bloodstain pattern analysis in Texas, it needed to be done in an accredited laboratory that you had mm -hmm. to have your lab had to be accredited in bloodstain um, that that's where they felt like it needed to go. And this all is um, because in part they had received two complaints in 2016. One was in June of 2016. The other was in October of 2016. Um, and both of those complaints dealt with bloodstain pattern analysis. And so they were really trying to get a handle on, you know, the, these complaints that were starting to roll in. Okay. One of the issues though, uh, with the accreditation had to do with the Texas Rangers though, right? There was an issue with that. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, um, moving, so they gave us a 15 month window to get your lab accredited, um, by an ISO accrediting, um, agency. So A and AB or A2LA. Luckily for Montgomery County is that I had a sheriff and an administration we had just come through um, getting our firearms lab accredited. Mm -hmm. And so we were already kind of on the accreditation, you know, um, train. And when we went to the sheriff and the captains and, and my direct administration here at the crime lab, you know, and it's like, hey, this is what the Forensic Science Commission has, has decided. And so we need to go on this. Um, and I had been operating under an SOP um, since 2007. That was one of the bloodstain classes I had had the opportunity to attend in Iowa was on writing a agency standard operating procedure and a training manual. And so I already had completed those and was following that. So then it really just became 
updating all of our other manuals to include the blood stain aspect of accreditation. Um, and so then February of the following year, um, in about, it was about a year that we were able to get assessed and we received our blood stain accreditation. Okay. But in that process, what we recognized was the Texas Rangers, right, are, they don't fall under the Texas, um, Texas Department of Public Safety Crime Lab. Okay. The, the Rangers are part of their patrol and, and I'm probably, my, my Ranger friends are probably going, oh, Tilly, you're screwing this up. Like, but they're, they're the police, right? So they, they go from being um, like state troopers. Okay. And then as their promotional process, they go into like, like what I did, right? I was a, a patrol officer and then I promoted into the crime lab where I became a crime scene investigator. So they are, they are highway patrolmen and then, you know, kind of the best of the best promote into becoming Texas Rangers. And then that is, they are tasked with doing similar to what I do is that they are investigating crime scenes for agencies that don't have a dedicated crime scene unit. Okay. okay. But are they very, well, I mean, I'm assuming that they're very hands-on, like these guys are they're oh, driving, they're, they're driving around. They, they don't sit in the lab and, no, and, no, okay. no. and they're not attached to a lab, right? They're right. attached. And so some of our guys, some of our Rangers, they may, they may have 18 counties that they're responsible for. So they could work a homicide in one county and then tomorrow they've got to drive, you know, six hours to another county for another homicide. Mm -hmm. And if, if their duty is to do the blood stain, there's only like a handful of them that do blood stain pattern analysis. So it might take two of them. So they might have to call a ranger from Amarillo to come to, you know, central Texas to help the other ranger do a, you know, like a grizzly homicide. Okay. Well, how do you accredit that guy? How do you accredit those two rangers or those five rangers or the seven rangers or however many they're ultimately going to end up with when they office out of their pickup truck, right? right? Because today they might be in this county, but tomorrow they might be 16 or 24 counties away. Texas has 254 counties in the state, you know? And so you have, seven Texas Rangers, five Texas Rangers that do blood stain pattern analysis. Okay. You can do the math, right? How many ultimately counties that they're responsible for. So there is not a, a system in place that can accredit and do an accreditation of a person in a pickup. And so right. the commission became, you know, very aware of that. Like, you know, we, we can't ask the DPS crime lab to now take the whole Texas Ranger division and put it underneath the Texas DPS crime lab mm -hmm. just so that they can fall under accreditation. So that's not what we wanted. Right. As, as, and I say, we meaning, um, the commission, um, put together a, a scientific working group for blood stain, crime scene reconstruction, shooting incident reconstruction. And when we were talking about this and there are several Rangers that sit, on that working group and it's like hey this this excludes us like we're not going to be able to get accredited based on how accreditation goes mm -hmm. and that's not what we want right we we want qualified people doing the work and so we had to be innovative and come up with a new idea of how do we get the same results without just blanket saying iso accreditation right so, so where are we today? Where, 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 what's the final outcome? So it's not final because it is still a work in progress, but we are actually um, in the process of, of drafting. Um, I think the commission calls it an administrative rule, but right now we are still in the draft document that is going to outline what, what our kind of what our bottom line is. So, um, you know, you have to have this coursework, you know, you have to have um, at least this many minimal hours of formal blood stain training, basically like your introductory course, plus 80 hours of advanced blood stain training, plus, you know, a um, blood stain on fabric course, as you talk with David Cam about, you know, that is something that, you know, for the last 20 years, we we have been working really hard to try to understand 
bloodstains on fabrics, um, the math and physics course, the fluid dynamics course, you know, all of these, these very important courses that an analyst needs to have in order to do bloodstain patterns. Um, you know, there's also other aspects of, of accreditation that are mandatory, like um, peer review. You know, if, if nobody, yeah. you know, technical review, if no one is reviewing your work, you know, I mean, that that is super dangerous. You know, if you are not taking a proficiency test, if you do not have continuing education, you can't go to a 40 hour introductory course 40 years ago and then never go to any additional courses. I mean, that that's not how it works. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they want you to follow a methodology. You don't just you don't just show up somewhere and then just, you know, kind of do it your way. That's not how it works. That, that is not, that is not scientific method. That is not, you know, having a, a reportable methodology, right? You just, Oh, well, I just go to the scene and I just, just let it take me where it takes me. You know, I mean, yeah. that, is, that is terrible. Um, some of the other aspects is, um, you know, we're all going to use, you know, we're all going to adopt, you know, uh, like the, the Organization of Scientific Area Committees, OSAC, right? They come out with right. um, methods. They come out with with these documents. Okay, are you implementing those documents? Are you following those documents? The Forensic Science Commission is a big fan of OSAC documents, right? Because that's something that has been, is current. It is something that's being looked at. It has gone through a tremendous process to get approved. And so once those documents are approved, the commission likes the idea that you're you're accepting those documents and you're following them. Right. Um, and so, you know, the, those are the kind of things that that we want. Also, as part of of the commission, there is a licensing test. And so unlike other, you know, maybe tests that you may have to take, um, this test is probably the hardest test I've ever taken in my life. Um, the training materials um, is about 700 pages. The binder that I made is like one of the, the five and a half inch binders. It's full. It's like spilling open. Um, it deals with case law. It deals with statistics, ethics, right? That's kind of a, been a big thing mm -hmm. lately, you know, yeah. and I have yeah. to have ethics to do this job. Um, you know, it deals with, um, courtroom testimony, um, and then different aspects of, of forensics. So, you know, that, that is a pretty, um, it, there's also, um, it deals with Brady, the, you know, the Brady law and, right. and, um, and the Michael Morton act, which is something near and dear to us here in Texas, because that happened here. So, uh, you have to be knowledgeable of all those things and then you have, then you're tested on it. Right. Well, so it's, Oh, sorry. Oh, I was no, just going to no. say like Holly Latham and Toby Wilson, they presented some things at the conference regarding OSAC and standards and things like this, yeah. uh, exactly what you're talking about. And um, yeah, I mean, I hope, I hope the ABPA can, you know, I, I think is disseminating the message that there needs to be greater standards. It sounds like Texas is a little bit ahead, but of course not all the states are at the same level. So there's a lot of disparity, I think, between um some experts in different states and and even globally you know the, so maybe the ipa can you know recommend some minimum standards for people that are in countries that are still developing bpa programs like we saw a huge contingency of people in south america uh coming up to speed and you know if they are now latching on um you know i, I think your message is going to have to be really important uh, for those areas too yeah and and you know to be fair you know Texans do a really good job at giving the commission a lot of subject matter to have to make these, these, you know, I mean, we, we seem to kind of run the gamut on cases that get looked at and, and um, are hitting the headlines. Mm -hmm. um, I think the last time I checked, there's only five states with an established commission. Um, and I believe besides Texas, there's only two other states that really are doing anything with their commission. Okay. And so, you know, I mean, with the amount of states that we have, if there's only really three states that even are doing anything like as any kind of forensic oversight, 
yeah, that, that is terrifying because like what, you know, when I, when I watched your interview with David Cam, you know, I, I'm thinking about the, the benefits that Texans have if they feel like, you know what, like I'm, I'm wrongfully convicted and I need someone to help me. Okay. Well, we have the Texas forensic science commission. Well, Indiana doesn't have that. Yeah. So you're basically, you know, you're, you're, you just fall prey to hoping that the appellate process works and that you have attorneys that are versed and can hire experts and that can challenge, you know, these convictions. And, and so, you know, I, at first the, you know, 10 years ago, you know, when we first kind of started hearing about the Texas Forensic Science Commission, it was scary. It was like, oh my gosh, they're the big bad wolf and they're going to make it so that we can't do what we need to do. And now I'm like, no, like I, I want to carry them in my pocket. And I'm like, you know, forensic science, Commission. <laughs> because it, it really does. I mean, you know, they're, they're not the big bad wolf. They're making sure that, that people that are being tried um, in trial and ultimately maybe giving their life for that, Mm-hmm. that everyone's checking the checker and yeah. there's never anything wrong with having your work checked. Right. And one of the, one of the cases that was looked at by the commission was the Joe Bryan case. And I know you had direct involvement with that um, testifying and, and that sort of thing. Could you give us a summary of what happened to Joe Bryan and your involvement on um, more recently on, on his case? So I didn't know we were gonna do this interview all day, Eugene. Oh, no, I, <laughs> I, mean, I can briefly. I can talk about, briefly. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think I, I'd like people to know about the Joe Bryan case sure. if they haven't heard about it. Yeah. So, um, as you know, as you know, I mean, brief to me is, oh, okay. So we only have forty-five minutes to talk about Joe. <laughs> okay, I'll be fast. Um, yeah, because honestly, you know, I could, I could talk about Joe for for days. Um, so yeah, Joe, Joe was a um, Clifton High School principal in 1985. He was attending a principal conference at the Hyatt Regency in downtown Austin. Um, he had gone to that conference and um, he had breakfast that next morning. He had gone down the day before, left earlier in the day because he has an eye condition that prohibits him from driving at night. So he went down during daylight hours and um you know woke up early was eating breakfast with his other principal friends that you know that was their their time to get together and and meet up and and get ready for the school year and um during that morning session he was met by his superintendent and an assistant principal who told him that he needed to come back to clifton which was about you know two hours to over two hours of a drive um, because something happened to his wife and ultimately his wife was shot um, four times in their home and after a five-day investigation joe was arrested for killing her and um he you know he immediately to- i mean told them like this is not me i did not do this i was at the hyatt regency like you have why are you why are, why are you blaming me pretty much um they tried joe in I believe 1987, that case was overturned. Um, They tried him again in 1989 and he was convicted of killing Mickey. And so off to TDC he goes. Um, And it wasn't until um, 2016, well, before 2016, but um, the Texas Innocence Project had got a hold of Joe's case and they were looking at it. And at the time, a Baylor intern by the name of Jesse Freud um, had started looking at Joe's case and she, you know, she just, um, dove into it and she just started doing all this research and she started, you know, um, talking to people and she, um, had talked to some folks that told her like, Hey, this, this bloodstain testimony, this is flawed. Like this is, this is bad. And so they went ahead and, and filed in, um, October of 2016, they filed a complaint with the Texas Forensic Science Commission. And so they had the commission had looked at it and really they didn't have anybody that sat on the commission that really knew anything about blood stain. And so, um, as I had said earlier in our conversation, two complaints came in kind of right 
um, right together. So they have these two huge cases, you know, that are really, one is um, in June, one is in October. Joe's case was in October. And so then um, that kind of was carried. They were looking through it, you know, dealing with all the different, there was some lab, um, lab stuff that was involved in that. They had a DNA person looking at that. And so then, you know, they start really talking about blood stain in November of 2017, which is where I kind of come into the picture. And then in dealing with the commission, you know, January, February, and now I'm on the phone with the commission because I'm like, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is, you know, and I'm showing up at their meetings. And so in May of that year of 2018, they asked me to look at Joe's case. They asked me to look at the blood stain portion mm-hmm. of, of the Joe Bryan complaint. And so I was like, okay, so of course, you know, because it's, it's there, I mean, there, it's a state, you know, it's a state organization. They're asking me for assistance. So I have to run it up my chain and I have to ultimately get permission from my sheriff to assist the commission in looking at this, at, you know, this two, two trials and all of this blood stain work that was done, including the testimony. So when I finally got the materials from the commission, I immediately, you know, started looking at, okay, let me familiarize myself. So I read the blood stain report and, you know, I start looking at kind of the lab results and then I start reading trial testimony. And, you know, it was like one of those, those train wrecks that you just like, I mean, you see the train coming and then you just don't get off the tracks and it's just, the train is like coming straight towards me. Um, and, and I remember that, I, I like just binge read those volumes and volumes of, of transcripts. And, um, by Monday morning, I was like, okay, you know, this is, this is the most egregious thing I've ever read in my entire life. And I like, we need to go, we need to go back to the County. We need to tell the, you know, the judge like, Hey, this is wrong. Like all of this is, this is flawed like we need to get joe out of prison right like we just need to like we need to fix this what was the main thing that you read or that hit you that said oh my god like there's something wrong there's like something incredibly wrong here that well i mean first of all the the methodology was completely incorrect the methods used have have never been um part of bloodstain pattern analysis it was obvious that the analyst was confused about the training that he received, um, as well as how to properly, you know, how to, how to, I mean, just basic fundamentals on, you know, identifying what, what stains that you use in a pattern to determine a uh, area of convergence. There was like, something, about, there was something about a flashlight though. Is it, what, what was that about? So that, that's a whole, I mean, the the bigger issue, I mean, so the methodology on just the, the stain selection, the determining an area of convergence, calculating for an error, all of that was wrong. Um, There was a flashlight that was recovered um, in the trunk of Joe's car that they thought had blood stain, blood stains on it. Um, They looked at the flashlight. They said, yep, this is back spatter. Therefore, Joe was holding the flashlight on Mickey when he shot her four times. Um, and that this is, this is back spatter, but Joe was standing within 46 inches of Mickey because after 46 inches blood evaporates and that, you know, um, all he would have had to do was stay in the crime scene for seven minutes because after seven minutes, all the blood is completely dry. And then you can walk out of a scene without ever leaving a trace of, you know, a transfer of blood. Um, He said that blood on shag carpet dries three, maybe four seconds than regular carpet because of the prongs that stick up. And it's not a big difference, but it's like three or four seconds. I mean, just just things that sound like scientific phenomena that like the jury back in 1985, I bet they were like, wow, this is fast. You know, like, look at this guy he knows everything. And, you know, I mean, the, the blood on the flashlight is completely suspect. Um, actually there was only one stain that was tested that even tested in 2018 positive presumptive. Um, 
everything else didn't even test, um, wasn't even a presumptive test. They did get DNA on the flashlight, on the handle of a flashlight. It wasn't Joe. And um, I had actually gone back just to see, you know, is there a point in time where blood will not test positive presumptive? So I went back, you know, our storage practices back in the 80s, you know, before we even knew about DNA, um, you know, I think that we used to store evidence in our jail Sally Port locker, like it was like a closet. But, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, South Texas is hot and, and it gets really hot and humid here in the summers. Um, you know, terrible conditions now to ever store any any kind of DNA evidence. But, you know, that's what we did back in the early 80s. So we have some of that old evidence. And so I went over and I pulled cases from, you know, 1980, 1981, 82, 83 on a different, you know, on various um, substances or substrates like um, clothing material on, you know, like um, non-porous items like glass and bottles and, and stuff like that. And I used um, our, our leukomalachite green, which is the, it, it doesn't have a very high sensitivity. So I thought, you know what, if something that doesn't have a high sensitivity mm -hmm. will I can test evidence that wasn't stored in climate controlled in a climate controlled area in the early eighties when it was collected, you know, so high degradation, low sensitivity and test that those items. And I ended up testing 12 different substrates and all 12 of them tested positive presumptive. Hmm. So I knew that, you know, like this flashlight that had been tested that was collected from 1985 and it had been tested in, in 2018, right? That my margin was a lot bigger than what those conditions were under. And the analyst that was, you know, he did a phenomenal job. Um, Brent Watson was the one from Texas DPS in Waco that, that handled all of that evidence on the retest and, and man, he, he did amazing. But there was one stain that he did get a positive presumptive on the bottom of the flashlight. That was it. Um, okay. And, but everything else, I mean, it really had a weird color. It was like a translucent color, almost like it was power steering fluid or maybe motor oil or something. It, it was almost like see-through, even on the original photographs. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they saw this flashlight, they thought, oh, boom, there it is. Look at high velocity impact spiral. As we heard, we've heard that, you know, I mean, same yeah. thing that, that, that David Cam mm -hmm. um, bites Joe. And basically they said he was holding the flashlight on her. And, you know, he shot her three times while she was alive, but based on this crazy area of convergence, area of origin type determination thing that was happening, he determined that the, the strings didn't cross in a fourth location because she was already deceased when he shot her the fourth time, because if she was alive, then you would have got spatter, but, you know, you don't get spatter from a dead body. Right. So, and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I done some research where I would, I could contradict that, but, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I mean, it just like, I, I wish I could point to one thing that was that they, they messed up on. It's the whole testimony. Yeah. It's this whole testimony is just made up, made up stuff. The and expert, it, uh, sorry, the expert on that though, eventually sort of admitted I'm probably wrong or some, or, but I wasn't, he said something like, I'm not lying, but I, I could be, I could be wrong. Something to that effect. Is so it? after we did it, I testified on behalf of the defense uh, for Joe Bryan. So I, I started off being a witness for the Texas forensic science commission. And then that um, after I rendered my report to the commission and testified to the commission about my findings, then I became um, a expert for, for Joe. And so I testified in a habeas corpus um, trial down over in Comanche, which is that county um, that it's, there's a three county, the DA covers three counties. So he ca covers Bosque County, Comanche County, County, and Hamilton County. And so they moved it from Bosque County. Um, it had been change of venue over one county back from the 85 trial or the 80 seven trial to the 89 trial and it went from Bosque County to Comanche County. So when we did the habeas corpus um, hearing, 
that was in Comanche County. And I went over there and I testified um, in that trial. And then after my testimony, um, Tom Bevel was um, the expert on behalf of the state. So the DA over there, Adam Sibley, had contacted Tom and had Tom look at my report to the commission and my findings and then had Tom, um, you know, he had hired Tom to, to consult for the state. Um, and then ultimately Tom, um, he agreed with all of my findings except for the fact that because there was a positive presumptive on that flashlight that, you know, he wasn't going to exclude that the flashlight wasn't involved. Mm -hmm. um, and then after the expert, well, and I'm not even going to call him an expert. After the person that testified in the two trials read my trial testimony and Tom's trial testimony, he then wrote an affidavit finally from a report he wrote in 1985. It took him until 2018 to then write a sworn affidavit that said, I am now aware that two experts said my conclusions were were wrong and therefore maybe they were wrong but i didn't lie yeah okay would uh i wonder if joe would be interested in talking one day about his uh about his situation i don't I know i would love to talk he, would he he's fantastic yes okay we may we may have to uh we may have to invite him on one time and see uh get his perspective on things too um, you, you mentioned uh, research, and you did a very cool research project uh, that, uh, well, for, for some people, uh, makes them feel rather uncomfortable, but it has to do with cranial back spatter pattern production utilizing uh, human cadavers. And I remember seeing the presentation on this in Fort Worth uh, several years ago. Um, we're moving on in time here, but I, I do want to just touch on this briefly. Um, give us a, a synopsis of um, what, was, what was it that prompted you to do this test and what you found? So I had um, worked a bloodstain case for another agency. And during my testimony, um, it was in reference to a, a victim who had been shot in the back of the head. And during cross-examination, the defense attorney had questioned me about, um, you know, the different ways that we create back spatter. And we create that by shooting into a blood-soaked sponge. And there has been a lot of... of publications that have done been done throughout the years where um, Dr. Carger had shot um, bovine calves with nine millimeter parabellum ammunition and then recorded the results. There was a PhD um, student that had shot um, pigs and recorded not only the gunshot residue and, and stuff, but also the bloodstain patterns that resulted from that. Um, you know, there's been, um, like I, for my, for reconstruction, I, I used a coconut so that it would withstand the, the percussion of the shot, uh, without, you know, breaking apart, um, and then hopefully giving, you know, a back spatter pattern. And so all of these things were testified to in trial and the defense attorney brought up a really good question on, you know, um, investigator Rossi, you are testifying that sponges and, you know, cows and sheep and pigs and all these other things have been shot and they produce similar results. But then you're trying to say that all of those similar results should carry over to the results of shooting someone in their head, but no one's ever shot a human in the head and recorded the results. So how do you know? And so I'm sitting in the witness stand and I'm like, well, it's an assumption because all of these other things behave the same. So it would be assumed that back spatter from a head would also produce similar results. And he said, but you don't know, do you? Because no one. And I said, well, no, sir, it's never been done. He goes, right. So you don't know. And I'm like, no, sir, I don't know. And after I got off the stand, I was like, oh my gosh, like we've got to figure out how to record back spatter from a human head. And so that became my quest. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, uh, this might be a, the subject for another time because I know there's yeah, more there than meets the eye, but it's, uh, it's, uh, if any of you, I've, I've dropped the, uh, the title of the paper, it's in the journal of forensic science. You can have a look there. Um, the last topic I want to touch on with you is training. So 
you've done quite a lot of training. You, you know, you're associated with these universities, teaching courses, um, and even abroad. So I understand you went to Vietnam. Is that true? I did go to Vietnam. Yep. Last February. Nice. And how, how was that trip for you? Man, you know, it's a long way from Texas to Vietnam. It's a, <laughs> that's a hike. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. A, that you don't just kind of, that's not a day trip by any means. Yeah. Was um, it, uh, these are brand, these are brand new, brand new people, like basic blood stain course. So it wasn't it, actually the, my trip to Vietnam, um, wasn't about blood stain. We, oh, we talked okay. about it a little bit, but, um, it was more of a, um, processing class. So it was a crime scene processing class. Mm -hmm. So it was three days for the Vietnamese ministry of securities, which is their like federal police. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, it, that was, I mean, I, I would go again in a heartbeat. That place oh, is nice amazing. Oh, that's cool. Um, you know, the people are phenomenal. Um, the country is, is gorgeous. And, you know, I really had a nice time, but, um, it's um i i don't think they're you know they're used to having americans come over there and and teach them so that that's a bridge we're going to build that bridge and, yeah, and hopefully yeah. um you know we we will have that opportunity again but yeah. um, it was it was an experience for sure are you now is uh, most recently have you taught the the basic blood stain course so i have a class starting next week oh there you go um, okay so yeah, yeah. We're getting a bunch of stuff there too. Yeah. Well, I have something that I want to show people because um, you did something really interesting that I didn't know about. And once I found out, I was a little bit in shock. I'm like, how come you never told me? So I'm going to play a video here of uh, this is on this is on a website. And actually, you know what? I'm going to play this clip and then I'm going to give you the website where you can get the full video. These are just some little clips of Chelly doing some training with uh, some notable people. And um, well, you'll you'll figure it out as soon as you see it, and then we'll come back. Have a look. What we're going to do first is take you over to the lab, and I'm going to introduce you to our law enforcement uh, division. They're going to teach you about blood spatter. With that, Howdy. I will turn you over to good these to folks. You. How's it going, Elizabeth? Jack. Good. Good. Chris. Jack. Hi. Jack. Nice to meet you. Whoa. So um. So what, what's the process? What are we doing? What we're going to do is we're going to put you in some personal protective equipment gear, so that'll be a suit, and then you're going to choose an implement to strike these blood sources. What do we hit? The mm -hmm. context of crime scene investigation or in crime, the blood source is a person. Mm -hmm. You're right. going to be striking a bloody sponge. And what kind of blood is it? <laughs> it's animal blood. Okay. So I, animal blood. Animal blood. I'm going to turn you over to uh, Chris and Chelly. He wants it real bloody, right? Sure. Uh -huh. What do you want to swing? You want a bat or you want a pipe? A uh, bat. Now hang on. You got to wait until we say batter up. You tell me when to go. We're going to step right out. <laughs> All right, go. All right, nice job. That is awesome. Wow. Really travels. We're going to analyze it now. Yeah, it's I mean, look, yeah, all the way over there. Wow. You can see how, don't like. Don't stand on the evidence. <laughs> I love that part where he says, don't stand on the evidence. Even Ozzy knows not to, <laughs> not to walk through the crime scene, right? Yeah. That was awesome. So there you go. I didn't know that uh, you did some training there. So what can you tell me about uh, Jack and Ozzy? What, what, what's their interest in, in the whole BPA and, and uh, crime scene? Man, they are amazing. Gosh, those are, they are some cool cats, I tell you. Um, so a lot of people don't know that Jack actually is a reserve police officer. At least he was at the time we did this um, in Muncie, Indiana. And they are huge history buffs. They love the military. They love law enforcement. And they, they just love to learn about things. And so um, they had a show. Um, Ozzy and Jack's world detour where they would just like go around, you know, to different places and they would learn about things. They would learn about military things and they would learn about police things and they learned about forensic things. And so then when they were looking at the forensics page, they saw, of course, you know, blood stain. And they're like, we want to learn that. And so it was cool because when Christine called and said, Hey, you know, we have this opportunity and I didn't know who, I just knew it was, it was something that was, um, 
being done at a university level that it was kind of a, you know, kind of a, a one day training thing for some VIPs that they had coming in. So I really thought it was, you know, someone in, high up in the university in the Texas A&M university system. And I didn't know until that morning that, that when Christine called and said, Hey, you know, like, so they're going to be here. The Osbournes are going to be here at like whatever time. So, you know, can you be here then? And I was planning on like heading over first thing in the morning. I said, wait, who? She goes, well, it's a production company. It's called Osborne Productions. And I'm like, like Ozzy Osborne? <laughs> goes, I'm not sure. It just, they said Osborne Productions. And I'm like, like Ozzy Osborne, like that's who? And she's like, okay, yeah, maybe. And I was like, surely not. No. So I drive over, it's about an hour drive to College Station. And like, I'm, as you can see, like in the video, right? I'm down on my hands and knees, putting paper down. Mm -hmm. Jack and Ozzy walk in and I'm like, oh, hi, it's just me. I'm down here on my hands and knees. Like, sorry, hello, nice, you know, <laughs> like, what do you do? You just like, yeah, yeah. Sir, sir, you know, um, man, they are amazing, you know, and, and everyone, um, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, depending on what age you are is, is the age where, you know, Ozzy Osbourne from Black Sabbath or, you know, him as Ozzy Osbourne or, you know, now, I mean, you know, the next generation of Osbournes and, and Jack, I mean, I had a lot of interaction with Jack, just, um, you know, Ozzy was kind of over, um, dealing with the, at the time, the, the division director and, and, um, we just, we really just had a cool, a cool interaction and it was great. You know, I had a, a side conversation that I don't think was ever caught on video, but Ozzy had made the comment. He said, you know, he goes, I don't know how you do this if it involves kids, you know, like I, I get like the whole like scientific aspect of it, but man, if it involved like kids, I don't know how you could go into a crime scene and do that. And I said, well, you know, ultimately it becomes where, I mean, that's when it's, it's super important that you are getting it right, you know, because kids truly are innocent victims. Um, you know, there's nothing a child does that, that the result should be that their head should be bashed with a baseball bat. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's where you have got to take the, the, emotional aspect out of it. And you've got to look at the physical evidence. And he said, yeah, he said, you know, he said, the blood's never bothered me. He said, I worked in a slaughterhouse when I was 17 for two that's, years. That's right. So I've never been, I've never been bothered by blood. And I'm like, oh, light bulb. Right. And he said, but he said, you know, blood's blood, but I couldn't do it if it involved a kid. Yeah. And so we had this totally like amazing conversation, right? Just kind of off to the side, just me and him. And, and I was like, huh, I said, well, you know, it, it, it's, it's perspective and, and you would, if it, if that's what mattered most. Yeah. And so he's like, I guess you're right. But, you know, and then everyone's like, oh my gosh, you know, he bit the head off of a bat. And I'm like, no, he didn't. It was a white dove. And it was, you know, everyone thinks it was a bat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but those were just stage bats. And it was actually kind of, he did it as a shock value when he was signing his record label, he reached up, they had released these white doves and he had reached up and for shock value, he was like bit the head off of a dove and like spit it across the table. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So, I mean, there's just like, people are, no, he bites the heads off live bats. I'm like, no, he doesn't. That's, you know, <laughs> that, that's not what he does, but dude, he, just cool, man. They are just amazing. Yeah, what a great opportunity that is. I uh, growing up, one of my friends, Ron. If you're out there, yeah, you know who you are. But he uh, he loved Ozzy. I mean, he went nuts for Ozzy. So I was a I was a, a an innocent bystander, and I got all the Black Sabbath and the Ozzy stuff on me. So I've grown to I've grown to appreciate some of his music. And uh, sure. Uh, and uh, hey, he's 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 looking pretty good, and he's doing okay. And I think it's super interesting that he's uh, you know he had an interest and took the time to learn about BPA. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a funny story about this picture that you have up. So they had signed. So we had the inside of that, that cube was lined in foam core. And so there you see right there, there's some cast off patterns. And mm -hmm. so um, Ozzy signed and he said, bloody great Ozzy Osbourne. And then Jack signed between the other two cast off patterns. And so I took, after they left, I took my, my pocket knife and I cut that out. And Christine's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to frame it. <laughs> and she's like, okay. And 
so I cut out this big piece of foam core and it is hanging in my living room. So I've got like three cast off patterns with Ozzy and Jack's um, autographs on them and it hangs in my living room. It's, it's definitely amazing. Well, it sounds very appropriate to me. So uh, look, we're, we're getting on in time here. So I think we're going to call it here, but I think that's a great story. And um, look, thank you so much. I mean, I, I consider you a person that's like a champion in BPA and I think you're very honest. I think you're very fair. I think you're, um, you know, helping the new generation of, of analysts that are coming out there with some really good perspective and everything else. Um, I think uh, the the last conference you did was, uh, I think, you know, you really, uh, you hit a home run and uh, did a great job there. It had some really good people involved, uh, people on the board as well. I think uh, some very, very strong advocates for, for bloodstain pattern analysis. So, hey, thank you again, Shelly. Hang back. I'm just going to say goodbye to everybody. And uh, yeah, I wanna, I'll, I'll just chat with you in a little bit. But thanks again, Shelly. I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Bye. Well, that does it, folks. Episode 15, and um, we're going to call it uh, here uh, for the year. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, when I got uh, started on this thing, I wasn't sure what I was getting into. It takes a lot more work than I thought, you know, ignorant me. I thought one hour a week and, you know, no big deal. But uh, there's actually quite a lot of research that you have to do on each of the people. Um, and But you learn a ton. I really learned a lot from the people who have come on here. Uh, they've been very sincere and very uh, willing to offer uh, their experiences and, and the things that uh, go go right and go wrong. And so uh, I'm really looking forward to next year. I, I want to continue this and hope that uh, in the new year, we're going to have, uh, uh, I already have some people booked uh, for January and it looks like uh, book through January and, and um, have some openings in February. But thank you all for, for listening and watching and I hope to see you next year. Take care and all the best. Bye-bye.